Hi friends, thanks for joining me. I'm Gio, and for fun, I write gay fiction and share it on my channel. Today's story is called Chasing a Dream. Get something hot to drink, sit back in your favorite chair, and I hope you enjoy. Let's begin. I only need a hundred, Gary said. You never paid me back for the last two times I loaned any money to you. I'm not wasting any more on you, I said. You know what? Save your precious money. I don't need somebody who has to hold on to every penny. Gary, my soon-to-be ex, shouted. Grow up, Gary. I'm not your piggy bank. Fine. I thought that boyfriends could rely on each other, but you chose your money over me. I guess we see what is important to you and it's not me. I don't see why I should waste any more time with you, Gary said. Lose the number, because I'm losing yours. I hope you're happy being alone. Late November, late Wednesday afternoon, the weather had changed. One day it was warm, the next it was cloudy and rainy. Nevada is like that this time of year. Thanksgiving is tomorrow, and I was supposed to spend it with my ex-boyfriend's family. They don't know we broke up. Gary never spoke with anybody unless he thought he could give money. Maybe he had by now. My parents took a trip to Miami to see my grandparents. My older sister flew to Paris to meet some friends. And my younger sister went to Acapulco with the father of her unborn child. They weren't planning on getting married. Which left me here, alone. I'm Trevor Wilkins, 22. I've dyed my hair dark blue, and my eyes are black. I've been on my own a couple of years, took some classes, but college isn't for me. I haven't had much luck with love. Gary left me because he always wanted to borrow what little bit of money I had. Reg left me because I didn't party enough, and Will left me because I wasn't stylish enough. It could be worse. At least I'm not fighting with Gary about money. Or putting up with Will and all his clothes. God, we needed an extra apartment just for that. Or Reg and his 2000 DVD anime collection. If it had ever been made, he owned it. I wasn't a rich, stylish party freak. I'm just Trevor the Ordinary. Trevor the Boring. Trevor the nice guy who always finished last. Why can't I meet guys that stick around? Why can't I meet a nice guy who acts like an adult? I walked around the streets of downtown picturesque Dead Man's Butte, the small town that nobody can find on a map. We're an hour north of Vegas, so it shouldn't be hard to find. But unless you know where to look, nobody can find us. Because of the holiday, a lot of places have closed early, but the grocery stores are open late so people can purchase stuff for their Thanksgiving feast. But not me. My family is gone, and I have no boyfriend. The only place to celebrate Thanksgiving is my empty apartment, and I don't want to go there yet. So I walked in the drizzling rain and tried not to shiver. I'm alone. Again. Who needs a boyfriend? Life is better without all the drama. Face it, Trevor. I want somebody to be with. I don't like being alone. I walked into a 24-hour mini-mart and stepped in line to buy a few snacks. An old hippie in a tie-dyed shirt, board shorts, and sandals got in line behind me. Well, Trevor, I guess Vegas has to be cold one month a year. I'm Carrie. Have we met? I asked. Somehow, the man seemed familiar, but I couldn't place him. It sure got cold fast, he said. It's almost winter. Merry Thanksgiving. Time for families and parties and something to be thankful for. I said, with a little bitterness in my voice. Life can be awkward when you're alone. The old guy's eyes narrowed, and he nodded at a guy on a bench just inside the park. There are two kinds of families, the one you're born into and the one you make. That guy on the bench doesn't have a family either. You seem like the friendly sort. Spread your wings and fly over and help him spread his wings. It's a little hard for him right now. You're crazy, I said. I'm called that at least once a day. Just this once, 
trust the crazy guy, he said. I don't know why, but as soon as I bought my snacks, I walked outside. There was a surfboard laying on the ground. We're in the Mojave. Whatever. I wandered to the bench. A man sat on it, wearing a rain-soaked hoodie and wet jeans. A suitcase and duffel sat next to him. The hood was pulled tight around his head. Something about the way he leaned forward, blowing warm air on his hands, or the desperate look in his eyes, or the way he sat alone, bothered me. Hey, mate, I didn't think Nevada ever got cold, he said as I took a seat. He had an English accent, and his sleeve had a British flag on the shoulder. We have our days, I said. It even snows, but it's only half an inch, and it happens once every ten or twelve years. Name's Trevor Wilkins. Darian Drake, he said. The hoodie slipped a little. He was my age, or close to it. Narrow face, high cheekbones, green eyes, and hair that might have been blonde if it wasn't wet. He was also nice to look at, and fun to listen to. You moving out or moving in? I asked, nodding at the suitcase. Neither, Darian said. Your bloody holiday has closed everything down. I just arrived a few hours ago at McCarran International and took a cab stray here. A cab from Vegas? Expensive. Why the butte? I was sick, Darian said. Hospitalization kind of sick. Last August, my appendix sort of exploded inside me. When they cut me open, it was worse than they thought. Infection, rotted tissue. I learned later they were afraid gangrene had set in, but it hadn't. I was dead for 30 seconds. Then I was unconscious in recovery for nearly 26 hours, and the docs weren't sure I would wake up. I had the strangest dream. When I woke, I had to come here. I quit my job, left the university, left my flat. My family thought me stupid, and my friends think I'm daft. For a dream on an operating table? I have to agree with them. You could do a lot better than the Butte. Tell me about your dream, I asked. Maybe later, Darian said, pulling his hoodie tight about him and shivered. Trust my luck. I had to come to the desert when it was cold. You came here because of a dream, I said. It was so real, and I remember every second, Darian said. My family thought I was off the trolley, but I came anyway. I don't have a flat waiting for me, no job, no school, I don't know anybody. There's a motel down the road where I tried to get a room, but it's full. Everybody's families have to have some place to stay. It's like that around this time of year, I said. So I learned. Here I am, chasing a dream I had during surgery, and I'm so knackered I don't want to move, and I'm so cold. I guess everybody was right, Darian said, suppressing a small cough. Good luck to you, I said, standing up. I didn't know whether his sob story was true, but I didn't want to get involved. If I hear of any place you can stay, I'll let you know. Do you have any money? The ATM won't accept my card, and since the banks are closed, I can't cash traveler's checks, he said, stretching and staring at the sky. He gave a weird chuckle that didn't have any humor. Hi, I'm Darian. I'm having a bloody good time turning into an ice lolly, and I didn't bring a paddle. I'm about to lose the whole bloody plot. I'm snookered, stuck, and homeless. It started to rain again. Not a heavy rain, but a light drizzle. Darian coughed. You'll make it, I mumbled, and got out of there. I didn't need to get sucked into his fake drama. Any minute, he'd ask for money. I walked out to the main road and glanced back. Darian looked lonely and small, and he coughed again, a long, dry, hacking cough that lasted for ten seconds. It didn't sound anywhere close to healthy. What a good actor. He could be a homeless con artist trying to play on my sympathy. He was only putting on a show and trying to get money from me. Leaving England because of a dream? Right. Another person who wants money. Even from here, his shivering was obvious. I don't know how true his story is, but whoever he was, he was freezing. It's supposed to be the holiday season, a time for being gracious and thankful and helping those who are in need. I could at least buy Darian a coffee. Returning to the mini-mart, I made sure the coffee was large, hot, and strong. Taking a couple of creamers, I walked back to Darian. The rain drizzled away, making the air cold 
damp and uncomfortable. Darian hadn't moved. His clothes were wet and he stared at the ground and his chest heaved with a stifled cough. Whatever the truth, this guy was sick. Have some coffee, I said, handing him the hot cup, the creamers, and several napkins. It will warm you up. He took a sip and his eyes seemed to plead with mine. Do you think I've gone bonkers? I don't know anything about dreams, I shrugged. I hope you find what you're looking for. Good luck and happy Thanksgiving. Darian coughed again and nodded. Thanks, he said, suppressing another cough. I got home just before a chill rain hit. I changed into something warm, put something in the oven to slowly cook, and turned on the portable fireplace. The heat soon warmed my apartment, and I sat on the couch feeling odd. Something seemed missing. I was warm. Darian wasn't. I was about to eat something hot. Well, Darian froze. Why couldn't I get him out of my mind? Why did him freezing make me feel guilty? Was Darian still on the bench getting soaked? If he was telling the truth, he had nowhere to go. I can't believe I'm doing this. I grabbed my keys, an umbrella, a blanket, my spare coat, and hopped in my car. The rain was heavy enough to turn on my wipers. I hoped Darian had sense enough to get out of the rain. He'd been coughing, had an appendicitis a couple of months ago, and had traveled across the world. Was I feeling sorry for him? I must be as insane as he was. I drove up to the park and huddled under the umbrella as I ran to the bench. Darian, I shouted as I approached. Let's get you out of the cold. He wasn't there. That's a relief. Maybe he found a motel for the night, or somebody took pity on him. I doubted. Homeless, no cash, no food, no friends, and he didn't know the town. Darian had lost his paddle and the boat and the river he was on. Where would he go? He'd find the closest place to get out of the rain. I quickly scanned the area. He would need something cheap because he had no money, and close because he had no transport. Next to the park was a covered bus stop. He had to be there. Quickly, I walked over. Darian? Yeah, mate, he said. He'd been lying down on the bus stop bench, his legs pulled close, and his arms wrapped around his knees to keep warm. I helped him stand. You look worse than a few minutes ago. Are you okay? Darian coughed. I don't feel right. This is Nevada. I didn't expect brass monkeys. I don't know what that means. Come on, let's get you indoors and warmed up, I said. You can chase your dream once you're better. I'd be daft to say no. I think I already am, Darian said, coughing. Could he get pneumonia this fast? I got him walking and kept the umbrella over him until we got to my car. I had just gotten Darian settled when he had another coughing fit. A deep cough that he must have felt in his stomach because he clutched his arms around him. I started the car, turned the heater up to full, and drove to my apartment. I can trust you, right? I asked. If you mean would I steal your silver and nick your antiques, my mum would kill me, Darian said, his voice starting to go hoarse. My boyfriend dumped me, so I have the room and a couch, and if you could pay rent, I could use the money, I said. You can stay with me until you get your life settled. You seem a decent bloke, Darian said, but I don't play tiddlywinks with strangers, or for money. Neither do I. You cook and clean like any other roommate, and we split bills 50-50 while you're here, even if it's only a week or two until you can find a place, I said. I'm not minted, so you'll have to wait until I get employed, he said. What's your 50 of the 50? If you want some rumpy pumpy with a side of slap and tickle, you can bugger off. I had to smile. A little conversation would be nice, nothing more. When you get on your feet and find a place of your own, you can take me out to dinner. No rumpy, slappy, tickly thing required or wanted. I'm not into weird stuff. Considering my luck with men lately, I'll be celibate for a while. You'll save a lot of... Darian started to say, and coughed again, and coughed, and coughed. I reached over and felt his forehead. Hot. Darian was fevering. When we got to my complex, I parked as close to my apartment as I could. Darian took his duffel. I took his suitcase. We ran to my apartment, a third-floor unit with vaulted ceilings and a great view of a strip mall. 
Somehow the rain had gotten in the suitcase and left his clothes damp. We placed his clothes around the living room to dry, and I made up the couch and found Darian an old pair of sweats. He was a little smaller than me, maybe 20 pounds, so my clothes were a little too big. At least they were warm and dry. I parked Darian in front of the electric fireplace and wrapped him in a blanket. I'll make you something warm to drink, I said. Thanks, mate, he said, and once settled on the sofa, he was immediately asleep. Thanksgiving morning, I got up and turned the flat screen on and pulled up the weather. This part of Nevada wouldn't see sunshine for a week. We wouldn't warm up either. Darian's cough interrupted me. He sort of rolled to a sitting position on the couch, and I stared at him. His face was flushed, and when he spoke, it was hoarse and froggy. Good morning, mate. I'm sorry, but I don't remember your name, he said. You're not the first guy to say that to me. I'm Trevor, I said. You don't look good. Do you want anything? To sleep for a fortnight, Darian said, but his voice barely croaked. You don't sound good either, I said. Darian's phone rang, and he picked it up. Hey, Mum. You sound terrible. I think you should get back on the plane and get right back home, she said. Don't be a ninny. I'm fine. I've just caught a little cold. I'm staying with a friend, and tomorrow I'm going job hunting, Darian said. Why did you ever leave? You don't have a place to stay, and why go to Vegas? Do you know how hot that place gets? I read that Las Vegas can get to 110 or hotter. It's the third hottest city in the world. It's in the Mojave Desert, so remember to stay cool and drink lots of liquids, his mom said. Right, Mom. Gotta go, Darian said. I tried looking up this dead man's butte, and I can't find it. If it's next to Vegas, do you know how hot it would get? Darian's mom said. Mom, I'll be okay, Darian said. You should never have left. Remember to use your sunscreen. Your skin isn't used to all that light, Darian's mom said. Heading out to breakfast, Mom, with my new friend. I've got to run, Darian said. Why did you have to go so far away? You sound so sick. Did you say, new friend? Can you trust him? Do you know what else Las Vegas is known for? She moaned. Mum, Darian said and looked at me, pleading. He mouthed, help. I shrugged, got out my keys and shook them. Darian, get off the phone. If we don't leave now, we'll be stuck in one huge breakfast line. They're also looking for servers. Hurry it up. Who's that? Darian's mom said. That's my new roommate, Darian said. Tell whoever's on the phone you'll call them later, I said, and winked. Much later, maybe tomorrow even. You didn't sleep last night. When we get back, I'm fixing you something to drink and you're going to bed. He's taking you to bed? What? Darian's mom said. Mom, it's not like that, Darian said. You get on that plane right now and come home, Darian's mom yelled. Mom, settle down. I'll call you later, Darian said. I know a place where we can get, I said. What is he saying? Darian's mum said. You're getting back home right now. You're more daft than me, mum. Bye, Darian said, hanging up. I take it she didn't approve of you coming to Vegas, I said. My mum always loses the plot, Darian croaked. I'm glad I'm in America. Even though you're sick, have no money, no apartment, no friends, I said. Found one friend, Darian said, glancing at me, then shyly lowering his head. I promise, mate, I'll pay you back. We will worry about that next week. Today, I'm putting you in bed so you can stay warm, sleep, and get better. I'm going out and finding us some breakfast and use some medicine. Face it, first day in America and it's cloudy, cold, and you're sick, I said, and felt his forehead. Very sick. I pulled a Darian off the couch and helped him walk back to the bedroom. Your entire country closes down on Thanksgiving, he said. They make up for it tomorrow. Have you ever heard of Black Friday? I said as we got to the bedroom. He sat down and I lifted his legs into bed and pulled the comforter over him. I know what Good Friday is, he said. In Black Friday, America celebrates discounts, I said. You'll understand tomorrow because we are going shopping for better clothes. Nevada doesn't get that cold, but when we do, it's cold. Darian collapsed in the bed and within a minute snored away. Poor guy. I tucked the blanket around him and made sure it was up to his chin. I wheeled the electric fireplace in to make sure the room stayed warm. Tomorrow, shopping and job hunting would be fun, but I think we'll have to go to Instacare instead. I didn't like how Darian looked or sounded, and his fever seemed worse. 
Maybe a day sleeping and some medicine will put him back on his feet. At least I wasn't alone on Thanksgiving. This was not how I expected to spend the holiday. But it was nice having someone to share the apartment with. It didn't feel so empty. I didn't feel lonely. Darian needed help. And I kind of liked helping him. I grabbed my coat and drove to the nearest 24-hour drugstore. I found some cough medicine and cold medicine, and for good measure, I got him some vitamin C. I picked up a couple of turkey TV dinners we could have later, and some lemons and honey. It took me a while, but I believed Darian's story. Poor guy. There must be something more to his story than a dream. Was he escaping something, or looking for something, or escaping someone? I guess I'm a sucker for the needy and lost. Call me St. Trevor. I got back with some takeout breakfast. Darian was still out. I woke him so he could eat and take the medicine, and then he was asleep again. His forehead still felt too hot. Instacare would be the top priority tomorrow morning. Darian slept most of the day and into the evening. The sun was setting, but with all the clouds, nobody could tell and I was binge watching old episodes of some sci-fi program when the toilet flushed and then water ran in the sink. A minute later, Darian joined me in the living room. Since I was a little bigger than he was, the sweats hung a little low on him, revealing a pink diagonal line with ten dots around it, his appendix scar. Feel hungry, I said. I can cook up a turkey dinner if you give me half an hour. As long as I can sit here, sure, he said. I gave him another dose of the cold medicine, and in 30 minutes, we celebrated the holiday with TV dinners. Later, Darian sat on the couch beside me, and we binge-watched for hours. Well, I did. Darian fell asleep on my shoulder. I placed an arm around him and let him snore away. Poor guy. He had traveled 5,000 miles just to get sick. I thought Vegas had all the crazy people. But I guess the Butte has a few too, because I'm starting to care about a guy insane enough to travel across the world because of a dream. Maybe Darian needed to get away from England. Maybe I'm desperate to not be lonely. It wouldn't last, but it was nice sitting here with a guy sleeping next to me. I shouldn't get used to this. When Darian was well, he'd find a job and get his own place. Still, it felt good sitting with a guy, taking care of a man who needed me. None of my other boyfriends had ever needed me. Gary only wanted money. Reg always wanted to party. Will was too busy trying to look good. None of them needed me. Darian did. Darian was cute in that lost puppy dog sort of way. Long legs, a mouth that invited someone to kiss it, and something about him seemed so vulnerable. Darian needed someone to protect him, at least until he got well and put his life together. In a week or a month, he'd move on with his new life and leave me behind, just like all my other boyfriends left me behind. A sudden cough woke Darian, and he sneezed. Covering his nose, he nasally mumbled, Sorry, and ran back to the bathroom. That was a nasty cough, and Darian was seriously congested. When I was sick, Mom always made some concoction with honey and lemons. Lemonade for the sick, she always said. With the honey and lemons I bought earlier, I made a natural heated lemonade tea. When Darian came back, I handed him a cup. It will soothe your throat and the citric acid will help clear away the mucus. Thanks, Darian said. How are you feeling? I asked. I can't warm up and I'm too hot at the same time, he said, wrapping the blanket around him. He sipped the lemonade for the sick and we binge watched some more of the sci-fi show. As he was falling asleep, I held his hand and led him back to the bedroom. Your mom's going to freak out again. You're taking my bed tonight. Where will you sleep? He asked. The couch and me are old friends, I said, adjusting the electric fireplace so the room would be warm. I fell asleep with the TV on and sitting up. About two in the morning, Darian and his blanket sat beside me. And he cuddled into me and we fell asleep. Friday morning, Darian didn't sound bad. He sounded worse. We woke with the dawn, 
I had a stiff neck and a stiff arm from the way we'd been sleeping. The skies had cleared a little. The rain was gone, but we still had some clouds. Let's get breakfast, Darian said. After Instacare, I said. Let's drive. I want to see what Dead Men's Butte looks like, he said. Around here, we call it the Butte, I said. His clothes had dried out, and he dressed. We were about to leave out the door when his phone rang. Hey, Mom, Darian said. What's up? Darian, you sound terrible, she said. What's your address? I'm sending your father to get you out of there and bring you home. Mom, don't. I'm just a little sick, and Trevor is taking me to a doctor right now, Darian said. Give me the address, she commanded. Mom wants your address. Darian handed the phone to me. I'm Trevor Wilkins. You don't have to worry about Darian. We're heading out to Instacare and get some breakfast, I said. Give me your address, because my husband is on his way and will sort you out and bring my boy back home, she said. I told her the address. There's nothing to worry about, ma'am. Darian slept quite well last night. Did he sleep in your bed, she said. Yes, I said. I slept in your bed, she screamed and hung up. Don't take it personally. Mom's a little high maintenance, Darian said. Did I hear her right? Your dad's on his way to haul you back to England, I said. You're over 18, aren't you? I'll be 22 in a couple of months. My mom's like that, Darian said. I took Darian to Instacare, and they gave him a shot and a prescription, and then we stopped at the Saguaro Diner for breakfast, and then we pushed through the crowds at a department store, where we bought Darian a decent coat and an umbrella and a couple of other things. We got home in the early afternoon. The medication had kicked in because Darian sounded better, and I think his fever had gone down. I think I like Black Friday, a holiday that celebrates discounts. We need one back in England, Darian said. I had fun, too. But I want you back in the sweats and in the blanket and in bed, I said. I'll get something heated up. A man stood at my door. He had a suitcase at his side and a grumpy expression on his face. Darian, it's about time you got here. I've been sitting in front of the flat for two hours, freezing. Everything about Vegas says it's hot. It never gets cold, but it's cold. The manager came by, and I had to explain what I was doing here. Then he must have called the police, and I had to explain again, the man said in an English accent. Trevor, this is my dad, Darian said. Nice to meet you, Mr. Drake, I said. Call me Philip, he said. Pops, you didn't need to come, Darian said. I'm taking you back to England where you belong, Philip said. Your mom said you were living with a pervert and you were dying. Pack your bags and climb into the rental. You're talking, Bullocks, Darian said. Trevor is a decent bloke. He rescued me from the rain, found me a doctor, and let me sleep in his bed. If you're worried about such things, he slept on the couch. Tell mom I'm fine and I'm staying. This isn't a discussion. If I don't bring you back, your mom said not to come back, Philip said. Do you know how much trouble I had getting a flight? Pops, Darian said, I haven't seen much, but I like it here. It's true, I was proper wet and cold when I met Trevor, and I got sick, but he let me stay with him, got me medicine and food, and helped me get some clothes. That's where we were today. Your mom says he only wants sex, Philip said. Darian, I'd be insulted if it wasn't so funny. Do your parents' trolleys always run on the wrong track, I said. That's not quite how we say it, but yes, especially my mum's, Darian said. Turning to Philip, I said, I'd appreciate it if you didn't insult me. I told Darian I wanted a little conversation and 50% of rent and bills when he gets a job. My boyfriend left, so I'm kind of lonely. It's nice having Darian around. And if you're worried about our sleeping arrangement, as I tried to tell your wife, I let Darian have the bed and I slept on the couch last night. Pops, I'm not going with you and tell Mom to stop nagging, Darian said. She won't, Philip said. She thinks you're over here on some fool's crusade. Traveling 5,000 miles because a bloody dream told you that you'd find love? You've lost the plot, boy. The real world don't work like that. You're coming home. You've never told me that you came to find love, I said. Why don't we get Darian out of the cold? I'll fix us some hot lemonade, and we can talk like civilized people. Philip, you can see that Darian is just fine, or will be once he's over the cold. As we entered, I set our coats to the side of the couch to dry and made the lemonade. We sat at the table and sipped our drinks while I got out a package of Oreos. Your flat looks like I expected, Philip said. A couple of college blokes on their own? But don't let your mum see it. She would hoover the paint off the walls. 
Tell me about the dream, I said. It was weird and everybody thinks I'm daft. I was walking along the coast at sunset when this old guy walked up to me. He was dressed in shorts and a tie-dyed shirt and carried a surfboard. His name was Carrie, and he told me that if I wanted to find happiness, I'd better turn around before I walked too far in the wrong direction. We talked about plants, how some do better in different soils, and some need more heat and light to thrive. I think he was talking about me. Then he said something about finding out what made me happy. Sometime during the conversation, we started walking in the other direction, back the way I came. It was a slow walk because my stomach hurt all the time. I apologized and told him about the surgery. But he seemed to already know. I felt like I could talk to him about anything, and I told him I wanted to find someone to love and who could love me. He said I couldn't do any better than Dead Man's Butte in Nevada, Darian said. I told you it was a weird dream, but I remember every detail, even the odd symbol on his surfboard. It was a scythe, you know, the thing the Grim Reaper uses. I guess it means he likes killing it on the waves. Darian took some paper and drew the design on it a circle bisected by a scythe. Dead man's butte. Do you know how hard this place is to find, Philip said. Darian, you had surgery and had a dream, traveled 5,000 miles, sat in the rain, got sick, all because somebody who doesn't exist told you you'd find love in a small town most people can't find on a map, I asked. Now you know why everyone thinks my son is out of his bloody mind, Philip said. I can't promise Darian will find love, but I can help him get a job and find a place to stay. He's welcome to stay here in the meantime, I said. I don't have a problem with Darian living here. His mum does, Philip said. Tell mum I'm planting roots in the States, and I've got a two-year student visa, so I'm not coming home for a long time, Darian said. Do you think I'm brave enough to face Martha? Tell her yourself, Philip said, and whipped out his phone. He dialed. A woman answered. Philip, did you find him? He handed his phone to Darian, but he could have held it on the other side of the room. Martha was loud enough we all heard her. Hi, Mum, Darian said. Darian, I hope you're at the airport, Martha said. I'm staying in Nevada, Mum. I've already bought your ticket, she said. Mum, get your money back, Darian said. Don't be daft. Do you know how far away you'll be, she said. What if you have to go back to the hospital? What if you need help? Stop worrying about me. I'm staying, Darian said. No, you're not. You will get on that plane and get back to England, she said. Don't disappoint me or your father. I had heard too much. I took the phone from Darian and said, When did you stop pretending to be the loving mom? Why are you disappointing Darian? Here in America, parents support their kids and try to help them find their dreams. Is it the same in England? Don't change the subject. Who is this? Martha said. I'm Trevor Wilkins, your son's roommate and friend. Why don't you show your son some respect, that you support him in his grand adventure? He might find someone. He might not. But he'll have the time of his life. Or are you so insecure that you deny your son the chance to learn who he is, to be his own man, to spread his wings and fly? Where had I heard that before? I'd heard it recently. I'll worry about that later. Mrs. Drake, it's time to give Darian his freedom. Don't clip his wings. Show him you love him by giving him the opportunity to travel, meet new people, and I bet he'll have some incredible stories to tell. She was silent. Give me a chance, Mom, Darian said. Only if you call me every Sunday, or write me if you can't, she said. Trevor, promise me you'll take care of my son. Already done, I said. Philip's return flight was on Sunday. Darian and I drove him down to the airport in Vegas. He hugged Darian, and we waved to Philip as he entered the terminal. Darian took my hand, squeezed it tight, and pointed. That guy by the luggage rack, do you see him? It looks like Carrie, the man from my dream. I looked. Almost hidden in the crowds was an old man in a tie-dyed shirt and carrying a surfboard. The surfboard had an intricate design on it that matched Darian's drawing. The man nodded at us, made the peace sign, and disappeared in the terminal. That's the man I saw at the mini-mart, and he told me I should talk to you. Dreams don't exist in real life. I walked with him for hours in my dream. I'd know that face anywhere. But that was back in England, Darian said. It's only a coincidence, right? It was only a dream, right? A cold shiver ran down my spine and I held Darian's hand. 
A dream that wasn't a dream. Let's go home. Darian got well, found a job, and his temporary stay with me became permanent right after his first Christmas in America. We became boyfriends and lovers by June. On Darian's second Christmas in America, his parents traveled from England to share the holidays with us and my family. Darian and I married, and to celebrate, we both got a tattoo with a scythe symbol on our left shoulders and drank a toast to Carrie. The dream that wasn't a dream that had brought us together. In the back of the hall where we were married, a man in a tie-dyed t-shirt and carrying a surfboard nodded and disappeared. It was only a trick of the light, right? We saw Carrie again a few years later. Darian and I had received confirmation that our adoption of a newborn was confirmed. We only invited a handful of people to the church for his Christian. We made an invitation we sent to our friends for a reception later that evening. Darian and Trevor Drake Wilkins wished to announce the name of their son, Carrie Drake Wilkins. A reception and dinner will be held at Mama Italiana's to celebrate the occasion. We'd like to offer a special thanks to our son's godfather, Carrie. Martha gave us some grief because how dare we leave off the names of the grandparents in favor of what we all know was a dream you had during surgery. When we exited the church, holding our new son and feeding him a bottle to keep him quiet, I adjusted our son in my arms. Carrie waited outside next to a surfboard. The old surfer nodded at us and smiled, gently shaking the tiny hand of our baby. Carrie Drake Wilkins. He's beautiful and healthy, and I approve of the name. And your tattoos. We all kind of chuckled at that. Thank you, Darian said. Somehow you brought us together. Carrie picked up his surfboard and said, I've never been a godfather before. I'm honored. I wish I could stay for the festivities, but somebody else is walking in the wrong direction. Oh, and tell Martha to cut back on the fried foods. Our baby made an odd giggle, and we both looked at him. When we looked up, the old surfer was gone. A dream that wasn't a dream, Darian said, adjusting the towel on his shoulder, and took the baby from me to gently burp him. I kissed my husband and leaned over to kiss our tiny son. We found our dream. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I ran into Jared from the Java Dive. His and Mitch's anniversary is coming up, so stop on by and say congratulations. Jared wanted to know what everybody's favorite coffee was. Leave a comment below, and I'll let him know what everyone says. Mine? Caramel Macchiato. Jared makes it just right. Peace.